Coming to you live from the Pensado Theater at the all-new SAE Los Angeles campus, Pensado's Place is brought to you by Vintage King, The Blackbird Academy, Audio Technica, Aftermaster, Isotope, Studio 202 DC, Avid, and The Recording Connection. Our guest is an indie rock stud. You will meet and learn a bunch from him. Interesting perspective from Vienna, Austria. We'll talk about that. Brand new ITL from the Master Blaster over here. And of course, updates on Pensado Wars 2015. We're rolling. You're at the place. It's Pensado's place. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, guys, I got some high level stuff I got to write here for a second. Okay, let's hold. We'll hear okay, right. there we go. Cool. Thank you. Glad you guys could make it. Um, yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. It's kind of that. It's we got that so much going week. on. <laughs> it really has. So we just jumped right into it. Yeah. It, oh, do you have you have something to say? I think. Never. Not not really. <laughs> cool. Well, then why don't we just get going? Let's do it. Cool, cool, cool. Hey, gang, how are you? Hope you are all good. Time for our weekly audio hangout. You've been liking and subscribing, and we've been liking and appreciating. Thank you so much for all that. To our partners, really your partners, Vintage King, The Blackbird Academy, Audio Technica, Aftermaster, Isotope, Avid, Studio 202 DC, and The Recording Connection. Incredibly supportive. Yeah. Always there. They make sure this show comes to you for free and all that stuff. Um, a quick, quick nod to one of our Pensado Capital Jam guys. Hassani Banks was one of the winners of the recording studios that we were blessed mm -hmm. to be able to give. He checked in, showed us how hard he is working with the studio he won. Congrats, man. We're yeah. really proud of you, right, Dave? 100%. You know, um, the neatest thing about doing this show is, is when the audience gives us respect and kind of says thank you by being at the live events and we see the fruitions of, all, of the, you know, the, the hard work that you put in and, yeah. and how that comes to fruition. Um, that just warmed my heart when I saw that because big deal. We selected the winners based on certain criterion that we felt they would do just that, and yeah, he went absolutely. out and did it. So you, you had a couple of guys. Let's 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 go on a stick. Send us get, something. Get now. some pictures. Um, by the way, a quick shout out. If you're a drummer, you know what black drumsticks means. It means Steve Gad, one of the all-time greatest. So thanks, Michelle Ito, and manager. I got a pair from him when I was like in my late twenties. Lost them. Met with her last week. She brought me a new pair. Had to show it to you. And back to the show. Uh, tip of the cap to our family at the Blackbird Academy. Uh, <laughs> their summer and fall classes are filling up. That's because you're paying oh, yeah. attention to what they're doing. And here's the end result of that. They're growing and teaching in a manner that not only educates, but gets people hired. Uh, I know an ebony and ivory duo. Ooh, wonder who that is. That might be teaching during the fall class. Not sure yet. I'll you know, I'll tell you who it is later, okay. but we'll, we'll hold on that. Well done, Karma, Kevin, Mark, John, and the Blackbird family. Uh, time for the big show. Ooh. Ooh. The PA Award. The PA Awards. So let me tell you why I brought I this. One. I have one, too. Uh, I don't know that I'll get another. <laughs> I paid for mine. <laughs> I did, too. Um, we're lucky in that this award in year one sits in places like Saturday Night Live, and Hans Zimmer's mm -hmm. Complex, and other kinds of places where people took it really seriously. And it is time for the Pensado Wars 2015, presented by Aftermaster. Six weeks out, or if you go to PensadoWars.com, you can see the exact number of hours counting down per Chevy's countdown. Ooh, that's right. Damn. Anyway, <laughs> our host, the always rocking Chris Lord Algae, hip-hop Don Young Guru, and joining us, Sylvia don't let the pearls fool you, Massey. Uh, she's another big-time rocker, and we're going to announce our fourth host soon. I think we have another week to figure that out. Also joining us, legendary Beastie Boys DJ Mixmaster Mike. He's going to be with us for the whole show and the after party. Um, we got more announcements coming next week. Here's a big one. The nominations are in. 
an illustrious set of music and audio practitioners. Some you know, some you won't, but an impressive group, if I say so myself. You and I checked it, and we were very pleased mm -hmm. with what's going on. Remember, two, two award categories will stay open. One is the Air Award. The other is the Unique Project Studio. We'll keep that open until about three week, two to three weeks beforehand. Air is for the best assistant, intern, or runner. Send a short paragraph on your person to us ASAP. Unique Project Studio is a picture category. Send pictures and a brief description of your unique home studio. And I'm telling you, I'm getting lots of submissions, so get them in. Both of those send to info at pensadosplace.tv. You see this URL right below me. Send it there. Um, and here are the details. Sunday, August 30th, historic Sony movie lot in Culver City, California, 7 p.m. in the evening. We don't want just a reception for VIP. We're making a reception for you guys. Your reception will be in the After Master Theater. It's actually sort of cooler than the VIP reception. You can hang before the big show, have a cocktail, try an Oculus headset, have your song Pro Mastered, which is a division of After Master, get interviewed by Graham Cochran from Recording Revolution, or Kevin Fleming from Urban Buzz, or Music Connection. You can hit the social media booth, take a flick, get it out. And then the pros, I'm gonna bring all the pros over to your theater, and we're gonna hang out before that. And then, when you hear this sound, those will be the bells calling you to the park for the big show. So while you're partying and while you're drinking and while you're sending the social media stuff, when those bells go off, you walk around the corner, we go in the park, and we have the show. After the show, then we head to the into the lair after the party. You can sit on the patio and chill out. You can get inside where the party is rolling. Imagine this, a set from Guru, a set from Mixmaster Mike, back and forth. I don't want to call it a competition, but, <laughs> but I've partied to both. Well, let's ask Chong or something. We went to Greg Wells' house and watched Mixed Master Mike. Do, he completely killed it. How yeah. painful was that? <sighs> People were standing around in awe, and he was <laughs> melting down. You literally just stood there in complete awe. You're <laughs> just like... in complete awe. So it's going to be pretty, pretty awesome. Quick note. Um, thanks to Anya Bosch yes. uh, from Vienna, Austria. Um, sometimes what we do in America may be interpreted differently. And so Anya was concerned that the booties bumping mascara melting line might be sexist. And when I explained to her or to the, that um, men have booties too, and it refers to us dancing, and mascara melting just means you're dancing hard enough to sweat. And they went, oh, we get it now. It's really cool. So in case... It was a great letter. A great letter. You know, I apologize, um, but I, I can't tell from the name, me being a foreigner, uh, if it's a male or female, but w what an incredible letter. And w we get we get letters from our audience, and they, they're always mm -hmm. respectful, and it, it, it was wonderful that you sent that. Yeah, uh, we had a really great exchange. Yeah. And so um, once we were able to detail that out, that's what it means. There are going to be two DJ legends. We're going to guarantee that booties will bump and mascara will melt. And yes, of course we want the ladies and the men to put on their finery, class up the joint, look good, make it hot and sexy, show the world how we do audio, baby. We don't take a second seat to anybody. So bring the noise. Let's make it hot. Where do you go? PensadoAwards.com for all you need to know. Tickets, location, hotel deals. Tickets are going fast. Hurry. The other URL, info at pensadosplace.tv to submit air and unique project studio folks. I probably know better than anybody how this is coming together, and I cannot wait for I August know 30th. the second mm -hmm. best of anybody, mm -hmm. which means better than him because he's doing it. And from an outside perspective, this is going to blow last year away. I know that's a bold statement, Herb. Cross our fingers. But I'm we're, telling you. We're going to pray and go for it. That's what we did last year. Absolutely. <laughs> and went bankrupt. Pray, so. go to the ATM and go for <laughs> it. Oh, Lord Jesus. <laughs> Maybe not this year. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. We want to see you there. Dave? Absolutely. Well, first of all, let's welcome back uh, to the corner office. He's our man, and he's known as... Sean Gore. <laughs> Put a black person in the audio booth whose timing. Is <laughs> <laughs> no, I love you, Coleo. Love you, love you. That was Cole. Uh, I don't know who triggers that. 
No, that could, that, that Welcome back, done. man. How was Japan? Oh my God, Japan was amazing. Tokyo is crazy. Yeah, it's you were there how long? 17 days. Wow, wow. So I got to be a, a full local and such a crazy city. I ate so much fish. I just... <laughs> we all have pictures of all the fish you ate, and honestly, there may be a deficit of... of... <laughs> Of but but he made friends creatures. with him before he ate well, him. That's that was what was the weird part. Well, the one where he, the fish was moving after he put soy sauce on it, and we all just went, oh, my God. And he was like, this is wonderful. So welcome back. We're going to try yeah. to, you know, we're going to well, send you to the doctor. Yeah, and, and make sure your intestines are okay. Um, good to have you back, brother. Good to be back. DP, what's our idea? Well, uh, it's kick drums. This will shock you. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that on BuzzFeed. I thought it worked. <laughs> That's good. Uh, actually, actually, I think it's kind of cool. Check it out. Hey, guys. Welcome to Kick Drum Part 18. I don't know where 1 through 17 went, but we'll find them somewhere. The world's shortest into the lair. Are you ready for this? Sound parlor is the group. Here's the kick drum. Amazing, but I thought I'd I thought I'd enhance it. Okay, but that's not good enough. Check this little sound right here. Now I promise you, I'm not I'm not messing with you. I'm gonna add that little sound. Watch this. That's all I added was that little sound. Now watch this in the mix. That's all it is. Sometimes in order for the ear to find things, you need the tiniest little bit of mid range. Now you can figure out what frequency that is. You know what? I'm going to play it again for you. Just sock, just rip it off. Somehow just rip it off. Okay. Let me get you a good volume. That's all you need to make your kick drums kind of stand out. I think that's kind of cool. See ya. He's a producer, he's an engineer, mixer extraordinaire. Imagine groups like this, Jane's Addiction, 30 Seconds to Mars, Chevelle, Audio Slave, even the lead song from Entourage. We had a great hang with Grammy winner Brian Virtue. Enjoy our chat. Grammy nominations, worked with Rick Rubin, Bob Ezrin, you know, 30 Seconds of Mars, Chevelle, Jane's Addiction, Audio Slave, Deftones, you know, all that's pretty good. Worked on the opening song to Entourage, the TV show and the movie, friggin' awesome. I, we are really <laughs> thrilled to welcome to our desk the one, the only, Brian Virtue, man. Brian. Welcome, bro. All right. Thank Good to you. have you here, man. This is a big one for us. Man, I was hanging out with Brian at my studio a couple of months ago, and I, I hit you up. I said, man, we got to have this cat on the show. Sure he said, man, let's get him on. Let's get him on. Hey, Brian, um, your path to, to not knowing much about engineering to where you are now has been kind of unique, and, and along the way you gathered some things that I think actually made you a better engineer. Can you describe your path? Were you trying to run away from your existence, or were you trying to run to something? Um, I don't know if it uh, probably wasn't running away from anything. Um, maybe running away from where I grew up, and uh, you know, I did that. It was I did that. It too. was music that uh, Saved you me. wanted to be in music, and yeah. uh, it definitely. It, as soon as I got in the studio. 
I probably stopped playing instruments and uh, it was, um, it just felt natural. Mm -hmm. it, it was never a technical thing for me. It was. Is that when you started the process of learning engineering? Did, was there school uh, or education involved? I, I did or? go to a quick school. Okay. Um, straight out of high school. I, I grew up a couple hours from LA and mm -hmm. I moved up here about 10 days after graduating. Hmm. But the school was about five weeks. And, mm, that's uh, short. Recording yeah. connection? It was no, <laughs> Los Angeles Recording Workshop. Do you remember oh, that sure. one? Oh, sure. I absolutely do. Yeah. And, that was uh, a good school, though. Got a, got a job, um, track record. I met sure. Dave there back probably like 90. Ages yeah, 90, ago. 91. Uh, Billy Idol was coming in and out back then, and Steve yeah, Stevens. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, uh, just, what was the what was the what was the owner's name? Tom. Tom Murphy. Tom yeah. Murphy. I like yeah. Tom. Yeah, Tom was a good guy. Uh, did I you guess still is. when you started your path? Did you sort of were you able to carve out working on things that were your musical taste, and and was that something that was helped you keep going, or did you have well, to go outside the box? Actually, kind of getting. Uh, um, one of my favorite bands, leaving high school, was Jane's Addiction. Oh, wow. And um, Dave Jordan had moved his, his studio, and his manager had the studio, mm -hmm. had moved into a new room that they had built at track. Mm -hmm. So that for me... Um, Heaven. <laughs> yeah, uh, I would... They still wouldn't confirm me a full-time position. They would call me all the time, but you know, wouldn't hire me to be an employee. And... But Dave Jordan worked out of there, so I wanted to work there. Mm -hmm. That meant everything in the world to me. Mm -hmm. When did you go to Nashville? I moved to Nashville 2008, um, so I was there. You moved there kind of with the intentions of being there permanently, didn't you? Yeah, I, um, I had bought a house in the hills, then I bought a console, put it in one of the bedrooms, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. thinking I'll mix indie projects on the side, do stuff. Um, and, you know, th this was when the industry was transitioning. I bought mm -hmm. right as things started turning down. I did too, by the way. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Boy, what a mistake. For me. <laughs> before you knew it, I was working out of the house yeah. almost all the time. And I was also, uh, starting to get serious with my wife. Yeah. And, uh, we're, I was just trying to figure out where the right path mm -hmm. was for me. Mm -hmm. And, the, the real estate prices in Nashville. Hard I was doing a lot of uh, kind of indie bands that didn't have big budgets. Mm -hmm. Hotels in LA are a killer to a budget nowadays. Mm -hmm. yep. You're a, you're like a you're known for for more your edgy hard rock approaching metal. I mean, when I think metal, I always think Nashville. Um, what did you? bring back from Nashville that you didn't have before you went? Because you you're working here now. You're living in L.A. now. Right. Um, you know, I, what I got when I moved to Nashville is we had a big property and I had a full studio. So rather than using commercial studios and, mm -hmm. and um, how do you say, uh, working out of a house essentially for your overdubs, I, I had a studio. But having all that space and doing everything from start to, to finish in your own spot, you learn, mm -hmm. you, you tend to think differently about how to it's approach a, things. It's a whole different tool set, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. and um, so, you know, I was doing all my records in my, in my studio. But did you have any interactions with classic Nashville uh, that th helped out? There wasn't a lot. I did not, you know, the country, the country world is, it's its its, it's, its own so scene. Yeah, um, that's right. And uh, I, yeah, there was, I was kind of, you know, 10 minutes out of town mm -hmm. doing my thing. I got, most of my calls still came from people, from connections I made mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when I was here, so. And you know what, that's not that unusual. One of the people we refer on our site is a, a really talented mixer named Robbie Burrow. And he went to Belmont University there. He's lived there forever, but he still finds himself sort of working in a space in Nashville that's not the major spaces, and you mm -hmm. know we'd had a lot of conversation about it. And I said that's not necessarily a bad thing, but you just have to know how to manage that space and not right. worry so much about. It. Is that do you think that's correct? Yeah, you know if you're not if you're not in the Nashville scene, you're 
you're just not in the scene there. And I, I think the corollary to our audience is, is that you have to be flexible enough to have your talent take it, allow it to take you where you should go. Like you can't make every definition. If I'm not that, I'm nothing. Mm -hmm. No, you may be something, but you may just carve out your own niche. Is that is that advice you think is is accurate? Yeah, you got to kind of the life is going to take you where it wants to. That's and right. You got to you got to roll with the bunches. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think it's great to set goals and you know say I want to be here in five years, mm -hmm. but you get what you get. It, yeah. You've made some of my favorite records, Audio Slave, Chevelle. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about the Chevelle record in a moment. Um, 30 Seconds to Mars. Um, in fact, when you worked with them, they were 40 Seconds to Mars, right? <laughs> and um, I try. One of the unique things that I've always found fascinated is your, fascinating is your approach to production. Like you envision the end first, and then you try to make everything, every part of the process, um, get to that end and, and usually that end is is with the vocals like you don't feel like you can know what a record needs to be until the vocals are in and did i describe it okay do a better yeah, job yeah i would for me when I'm, I'm producing a band it's like get the drums and some bass and guitar on that song and get the singer singing because mm -hmm. the way he sings in the rehearsal room or on the demos isn't necessarily going to work in, in the way we're recording the mm -hmm. song and he's going to have to learn learn how to fit comfortably in the way we're doing the record and that's the most important track you know that's the track that when you're mixing that's the track that you're mixing and everything else supports the vocal yeah. Yeah. um so i yeah i try and get the lead vocal on there immediately and go okay how are, how is this song moving now and then how you have, are, you have a guide are, map at that point in time in terms of what you want to do once you have that vocal. Yeah, well, what we definitely have a, it depends on the project, but you try and have a really clear vision yeah. of, of where you're trying to end up. But. Do you prefer working with a band that has practiced, <clears throat> written, practiced, and rehearsed 10 songs before they got to the studio and they're mostly completed, or a band that actually makes stuff up once they get to the studio? I like, I like the ones make it up in the studio? I mean, when when you're making it up in the studio and you, it's magic, mm -hmm. there's nothing better than that. Mm -hmm. and it just, you mm -hmm. feel so lucky to be sitting there. It, mm -hmm. It's not work. Yeah, I guess the you labels know. probably don't like that as much. Yeah, but. it doesn't happen much anymore. You know, let me so, ask you, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. But th then there are bands, you know, like doing Audio Slave with Rick Rubin, they rehearsed like crazy before coming in and playing so it's not an mm -hmm. it's not an experimenting record so, mm -hmm. so i don't think there's a you know like with everything there's not a right or a wrong so different. so for both of you when you have the making it up as they go along do you know when magic is happening or are you just capturing it and hoping well, you you know when magic yeah. for but, me yeah but, but you know yeah. yeah it's something you almost intuitively feel right yeah yeah and, yeah. and generally when it's not happening <laughs> Everybody is in too. a bad mood. <laughs> you know how you Everybody's can tell when it's off. not happening? Because mm. you're back in Palm Springs at your swimming pool. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that would be you. I would be being cussed out by a label head. <laughs> like, why did you let him do that? But, do I have your permission to just change the subject? You, of course. When you said uh, Rick Rubin, I just immediately thought you've worked with Rick Rubin fairly closely and you worked with Bob Ezrin, who could be a mentor of yours. Compare and contrast the styles of Great Rick question. Rubin and Bob Ezrin. You know, Rick is the, the the quintessential kind of Buddha guy that everybody, yeah. you know, he seems like in the, if you see an interview or read, read an interview with him, and everything, he's very abstract in how he communicates with his artists. There's a lot of make it excellent. And he'd even say to me, you know, make this sound excellent, which is <laughs> pretty vague. Ah! Um, but it, it really empowers a lot of people, and he just has a way of bringing the best out of mm. out of his artists. And um, it, he doesn't even need to explain where the album's going because his sound is so defined, and he, he expected me to know what the Rick Rubin sound was mm. before working with him. Mm -hmm. um, whereas Bob, on the <coughs> other hand, is very hands-on, and mm. it's not vague. If someone someone plays something and he hears something great in it, 
but isn't perfect. He's, no, you should have played this. And, mm, mm. Um, and Bob is, you know, almost to the, you know, I don't want to say anything bad, but he's almost to the point of micromanaging. He knows oh, everything. So they're just very, that, that would be the which, most difficult. Which is, as, as an engineer, which do you prefer? Not, not people, but which concept gives you the most freedom to, to feel like you were part of a project creatively? I mean, they're different, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, with Bob, we have a really close relationship, so I, I'm much more well, Bob, able to speak my mind. Like on, on some of the records you've done with Bob, he basically has a full schedule, and he'll entrust you with a lot of, you get co-production credit, so that means he must trust you on a higher level than just an engineer. Well, so. yeah, the, the first record we did together was the first 30 Seconds to Mars, mm -hmm. and he had owned a company and sold it, to Clear Channel and mm -hmm. had a, basically a nine to five at Clear Channel. So from the get go, he brought me in to co-produce. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And uh, that's where Bob is great. He was definitely the, the mentoring figure. Mm -hmm. on, on Rick, how do you find the sweet spot on monitors when he does everything by floating on a magic carpet? <laughs> <laughs> Does it does it stay still? Does it go up and down? No, it's just, an ITL. Well, it is an ITL. Can we get to Rick and do an ITL? <laughs> Engineering aloft. <laughs> That's. Uh, um, I mean, the, the the people that I know More who worked with Rick, meaning, you know, right? Yuta Benatar has worked with Rick and so on and so forth. But they all come away with it. It's kind of an existential experience, and you just go on this ride, and at the end of it, there's a record. Kind <laughs> of is that is that an app description? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Is he a good guy? Yes. Yeah, that's what I've heard too. I've yeah, heard that it's too. It's cool. Um, I admire a lot of his music. It's really impressive. I guess he's like Ron Fair because Ron Fair would never tell me raise the snare 2 dB. He would go, I need more Rice Krispies, which means I need more Snap, Crackle, Pop, mm. that kind of stuff. Yeah. It would give you boundaries within which you could be yourself. Mm -hmm. I, I guess that's what, kind of what Rick does, huh? Hmm. Yeah, and it's very... He uses very empowering terminology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think you know something like snare. He would be really direct. And he, mm. Mm. On the um, on the sci-fi crimes album, Chevelle, oh man, that's one of my favorite sounding records ever. And um, Letter from a Thief is one of my uh, one of the songs I love to reference when I'm working on rock things. It, it's it's not just a rock song. It it, it spans such a wide. Um, well, that band spans such a wide spot in the genre, going all the way from just rock to, to flirting with metal. Um, on that song, the guitars, especially that guitar on the right side, I, I, know, I know you might have forgotten some of this <laughs> stuff, but just make it up. It's okay. Just, just make me happy. Tell me something I didn't know. Um, the guitar on the right side is just amazing. Do you remember what, 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 did you use pedals on that, or was that in the mix, or how did you get that sound? Um, it doesn't sound like a classic Marshall. What, what was it? it? Most likely probably was a Marshall. We, we experimented a lot, especially on that song. Um, I remember the chorus guitars in that. In That's the ones I like. They, we, we were definitely inspired by early Smashing Pumpkins records, mm -hmm. um, the bands from Chicago, mm -hmm. and that just kept coming up at that period. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of layering we started the record trying to go minimal, like let's just try and do two tracks of guitar, I keep like, it bare bones, like that, and that, that had, you know, stacks of fuzz, you know, mm. the, the big thick ones, the mid-rangey ones, the bright fuzz, and um, yeah, I, I remember in particular, by the last course, there's six tracks of guitars through fuzz pedals alone, on top of probably some, some straight amps. Um, the, the most fud pedal, fud pedal, let's <laughs> <laughs> give you um, kind of a, um, an odd harmonic sound. Right. But the, the guitar on the right has almost a more even harmonic sound, which eliminates that ninth, which doesn't, doesn't feel pleasing. How, I mean, you're sure there were guitar pedals? I, there, sure I, I know. Cool. I know some of them were. The um, solo, I bet, was, the solo on that, I bet, had a lot of guitar pedals on it, because that yeah. solo is just nasty. That solo would definitely, he had a weird pedal that he had used on his demo, but then when I was mixing it, I just couldn't get it as 
forward as I wanted, and I think I probably, if I remember correctly, put the PSA one plug-in on the solo. Oh, mm. the, and just you mean the Chad Blake plug-in? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Just an FYI, every answer in batter's box can't be sans amp. This no, time. it won't. I'm not. We have that. a no sans amp policy since Chad's been on the show. <laughs> I just couldn't get it ugly enough. You know, you wanted um, it to. I wanted nasty. it to feel like there's no like apart. bit crunching yeah. in there. Like, did you lower the sample rate or anything? No, no. Hmm. And and I, I don't know what the word glue means, but it feels like that mix just has a cohesiveness, kind of like spaghetti sauce in the refrigerator the next day. You know, <laughs> you don't taste the garlic or the onions or the bell peppers. It's just a great sauce. Mm -hmm. What was it about that, that you did to that mix? If if anything, maybe you just got lucky. I don't know, but that just makes it feel like a band, and it just feels like. Everything's working in concert, nothing. It's just an, a wonderful, wonderful example, guys. Check it out. Um, Letter from a Thief, it's on Spotify. I listened to it again this morning, and it, it's just amazing how it's just perfect. Uh, stress. Um, <laughs> I had actually, uh, that, we had gotten a new A&R guy right before we started, mm -hmm. actually, when I was in the middle of pre-production, and I had no uh, relationship with Pete Kaberga at Epic. Mm -hmm. um, and so he was a little apprehensive. I, we had actually planned to use an outside mixer on the record. Mm -hmm. And so that particular song, I had done great rough mixes on the four songs I wanted to show to the label, and the label flew down. And that, that was obviously one of them. I knew it was a single. And the, the rough mix just, was great and then we we had an outside mixer didn't quite get what we were going for and about three songs in decided I'd mix it um, so I actually mixed I mixed that record in uh, Justin Neenbeck's uh, room at Blackbird sure. he was on vacation so you did get something from Nashville <laughs> oh, yeah <laughs> um, but that was the first song I mixed and I had to turn in a mix mm. that afternoon or that evening never been in the room mm. you know you're loading i knew i wanted to start from my rough mix so i brought all my all my outboard gear that i used in my room and mm -hmm. try to keep it as simple as possible i ended up plugging in much more of the the studio's gear but mm. so you're saying justin left a little bit of his vibe and electrons hanging around and you kind of snuck them into your mix maybe <laughs> <laughs> so do you remember was there was there an element on the stereo bus that 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 helped i mean were you using the, the bus compressor it was a bus compressor there was i had a lot of uh side chain compression going on what um everything and I, it was it was not oh, you mean like michael brower style side compressor chain like yeah oh, okay. busing because I, I would typically maybe bust my drums over to my distressors. Okay. Uh, they, you know, they just tend to make drums really feel uh -huh. dirty and mm -hmm. heated up. I have uh, an Allen Smart that would be on my, mm -hmm. my rough mix, but I didn't need that because the board had one. And uh, they had some Fatso's. I know the Fatso helped a lot. Oh, to okay. really just you had that on stereo bus? No, off to the side. And, oh, okay, and paralleled into it. Yeah, and it, there was no rhyme or reason what got sent to watt compressors. Um, it was not an organized mix in that sense. It would just keep sending stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you, did you put an EQ across the stereo bus? You yeah. remember? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's just such a great mix. Speaking of the drums, um, a lot of times as an engineer we get seduced by all the mics that we're given and there's this over overwhelming need to use them all in a drum mix and so you end up putting too much ambience in the mix and ambience is another definition for moving the sound back, you know, making it sound like it came from the back of the theater or the back of the room. But those drums were like right here. How did, how did, you, how did you pull that off? Was it part of that parallel compression thing? That, but yeah. that would make the ambience appear to be longer though, wouldn't it? Uh, you just don't use much of your room mics. You know, oh, you okay. keep them... Uh... Did you record the drums yourself? Yeah, we actually did that in my room in Nashville, which was another reason why it was so stressful. I'd been there about a year, mm -hmm. but it, it had been a very transitional year, so it was the first really big record I'd done in, mm. in quite a while. 
And I did it in my studio in Nashville, and uh, there was a lot of pressure to to make everybody happy with mm -hmm. that mix. And you got ten hours in a new room. Yeah, pressure is a good thing, though. I guess. Yeah, I, like oh, I said, I, I always need a deadline. I think pressure works. Let's let's see what Chunk, where you got a question over there for our guest? Yeah, we do. This first one's from Alex Totterall. On Finch's Anywhere But Here, what were the vocal effects you used on Nate's voice during the vocal or during the chorus? Oh, great. great um, I can't remember specifically. I probably, uh, with something like that, I probably had about five or six. A lot of that would have been plug in effects. I was still mixing on a board then. Mm -hmm. But um, generally, at least one or two pitch shifts. Um, mm -hmm. I think I used sound toys. An that, H3000? The, the micro shift one. Yeah. That always at least a couple of echoes and mm -hmm. a few yeah. different. It was a, a, a washed out sound. I wanted it to feel like, That's you know, good. too long of a reverb and you just sound like you're in a hall. Mm -hmm. If it's just a short reverb, you got no space. So you need a couple of reverbs and a. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had a client tell you, I don't want to sound pop and I only want to sell a hundred records? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not the second half. <laughs> the half. Yeah, rarely, rarely that. <laughs> you know what, let's get one more from Chong. <laughs> you didn't like that one? No, I loved it, actually. Can I keep my job? You can, absolutely. Okay. But just prepare a batter's box. So that's coming oh, up. I'm ready right here. Uh, what you got, Chong? From Brian Linares. When you're recording guitars, do you prefer big amps or little amps? Um... Again, there's no rhyme or reason. The little amp can be magic. Uh, I was, I, I've had a few artists come to me and they'll have some little practice amp and you're like, they'll say, this is our secret weapon. It's like, yeah, everybody, mm -hmm. everybody knows that. But if you already have a huge wall of guitars and everything sounds big and you want to kick it up a notch, if you try and add two more huge guitar sounds that have tons of bottom end and tons of top end, where are you going to fit it? And then you get that little practice amp that has no bottom end, mm -hmm. no top end, just all mid-range. You hear that because, you know, uh, I always think of it as mixing is an illusion. Mm -hmm. And you mm -hmm. only have so much mm -hmm. space to work with. Mm -hmm. So you add a little tiny guitar sound and you really feel that. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to find room. So the little amp can be amazing for a... Uh, Mm -hmm. from, from the from the standpoint that it can sound much bigger at the end of the day, but it, it's never going to put out the sound that a you know a big four twelve cab is going to mm -hmm. do. One thing, I, one, tell me, tell me if this works for you, Brian. One thing I've noticed is is like when I'm playing through my Marshall, and you just have to go Spinal Tap with a Marshall. It, if you turn anything below eleven, it doesn't sound good. <laughs> But it restricts you because of the, the overtone harmonics. If you play something other than a root fifth or maybe two chords on the, on the, on the EAD strings, the, the low strings, you get this mush. Right. And the top strings, the G, the G B, and E, don't, don't, they, they're okay. They usually cut through. But when you go to a small amp, you remove that hash from the low string. So now they come through clearer. And so you're adding a little bit of clarity if the, if the guitar player is playing more than two notes on the low strings. Right. Uh, sometimes that's what I find a little amp does. Sometimes I'll even use a um, a direct signal just to just to get that clarity on mm -hmm. the low strings too. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. All right. So, do you like sports at all? Ah, uh, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yay okay. for the home it, it, team! It, it I'm going to win one. Amazing. I'm going to win one. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, just go back to your childhood when you played bam bam with anything. Sure, and he sure. throws something up, just bam, bam it away. Are think, you ready for batter's box? I got box? an advantage. What were the last three pitchers to throw a no-hitter for the Dodgers? <laughs> <laughs> just make up some Next. Uh, Kick let's, drums. Uh, okay. Kick drums. Uh, punchy and uh, hitting me in the chest. Ooh. I want to feel it. One of my favorite bass sounds is the sound on letters. Bass guitar. Um, dirty and ugly. Ooh. Anything you use to make it dirty and ugly? On that, it, we had, there was a direct, probably a sans, I probably took four channels, direct, sans amp. <laughs> Sorry. No sans amp. So no but sans it, it wasn't amp. the only, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> and other he had a Mesa Boogie amp, and I think we had an old there amp peg, like VT4. Oh, gear's good. We like gear. Go so, vocals. Vocals. Um, 
1176. There you go. Stereo bus. SSL compressor. Mm. Reverb. Lately, I have 480, or now I use uh, R Vibe or, or Revive a lot. Oh, okay. But I like that too. Strings. Strings. Have you ever seen strings? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, gosh, there's. Uh, I'm torn on that one. Ooh, uh, I really lean towards uh, Big and Lush, but then I, I, I like the old records where they, they didn't treat them nice. You know, they, they weren't afraid to, <laughs> to EQ and compress them. Mm -hmm. uh, piano. Piano. Um, big and wide. You know what? He, he's a synth player from the 80s. Mm. Synthesizers. Jupiter 8. I never oh, owned one, but I always drew all Okay, I quit. Classic sound. <laughs> Delays. Delays, uh, 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 the Echo Farm, I use it like crazy, um, but. Well, you look, you have a, you have a suspicious I, look. I, I, I'm, a, a I'm on Pro Tools 11, I don't have Echo Farm Oh, anymore. I got you. I was so like, I was pining for the Fiords. Oh, I see. <laughs> um, um, if your studio caught fire, what one piece of gear would you run out with? Probably my distressors, you know, they're, I, I wouldn't say they're the most, uh, you know, you need a piece of gear, but whenever I use them, I, I love them, I'm happy, you mm. know, mm. I just, they work. Okay, he won. Well, it's the, it's a first in batter's box because it's the first non-athletic athletic win like he, <laughs> he didn't commit to being an athlete but knocked stuff out of the park which is nobody else has ever done everybody else says oh i'm an athlete i'm an athlete so he said no i'm not an athlete but watch this so <laughs> so guys something that has been on my mind i want your help hit me up and let me know if i'm right or wrong everybody in this room can do the same thing uh herb i want you i want your help too is it is it possible to eq compress uh, produce, mix your way to a genre. Either I don't I don't know that genres are real things. Mm -hmm. I think I think they're a construct from radio that, that that helped us paste things in certain slots so we could sell Buicks. And 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 I don't know that you can record your way to edgy, raw, in your face, punk, real. I mean, you give. Led Zeppelin and Mandolin and Robert Plant, and you got a heavy metal song. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You take Keith Moon and let him play drums, you got a punk song. Mm -hmm. you, you take two rappers in the late 80s with, in a rap battle in a room at Enterprise, you got a, you got a hip hop song. Mm -hmm. But you, you can't manufacture those things. You can enhance them as an engineer, you can enhance them as a producer, but you can't create them. It has to be created by you guys, the creative people. And, and we can enhance it, but, but when you come to us and say, make it, make it this, make it that, make it this, you're asking for a non-engineering solution to a, a, a problem that started way farther up in the process. That's right. Um, it's about truth. No, I'm not complaining, because I like to try more than any human being, mm -hmm. and I can hijack parts of the process that aren't li literally my parts of the process, and I enjoy doing it, but... Um, I was, it was just on my mind. You know, so. come, you know what comes to mind when you say that as we wrap up? Um, <clears throat> remember when we did Peaches? You did mm -hmm, Peaches? Mm -hmm. She was so authentically who she was. Yeah. There's nothing you could do about yeah. it. And then that tells you where to go. Mm -hmm. And I, <clears throat> you know, as a non-engineer, but somebody's in the space, it's really about honesty. Mm -hmm. It's about not being afraid to be who you are. Mm -hmm. Bring that to the table. And that helps everybody else define mm -hmm. what they need to do for you. Is that what you find as well, too? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean... Uh, because if you're just willing to be anything, you're just jello. Yeah, uh, it's, it's it's great when you have an artist that is Clear. them no matter what. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look right below here, you see that right there? Go to Recall and get some exclusive content from our guests and enjoy a little bit more of Brian Virtue. <laughs> Say goodnight, man. Okay, guys. Thanks for bearing with us. Had a great time. See you next week. See you later.